All right, everyone, I am in the small town of Goliad, Texas. This town is one of the most sacred places in Texas in terms of its history. Incredible events happened here. I mean, events that equal the Alamo. Surprisingly, you don't hear about it as much. But I'm going to tell you about this town and the events that happened here today. Now let's look at a map real quick. You can see I'm kind of out here in the country, in rural Texas. But back to this courthouse that I gave you a glimpse of. I mean, wow. Built in 1894. This is Second Empire architecture. That is French architecture, Napoleon era. And it is a little bit unusual. You don't see it a lot here in the US. It is astonishingly beautiful though, isn't it? I'm trying to give you a good look because the sun is on the other side. You see the roof line and the gables? That is the dead giveaway for Second Empire architecture. If you've ever been to Philadelphia and saw Philadelphia City Hall, which in my opinion is one of the most beautiful buildings in all this country, that is another example of Second Empire architecture. So I'm here in a square in the middle of downtown and there is a tree that is quite significant. This is it right here. Now this has been here for several hundred years. It's part of the history of this town. When you look at this tree and these bows or branches that are kind of level, that reach far out and are very sturdy, what do you think they could be used for? Especially in the early 1800s. If you've guessed hanging, you're right. This is the hanging tree. Between 1846 and 1870, and that is before this courthouse was built, by the way, during that time, trials were held right here in this square, usually outside. The verdicts were handed out quickly and the condemned were marched to this tree and hung. What is that? Over 30 years of hangings right here under this tree. I would guess that this would have been a prime spot right here. As I understand it, over 200 men died hanging from this tree right here. Hung from where I'm standing right this very second. You can just feel it. You know, you can feel the ghosts. It's crazy. Most of these buildings were built in the late 1800s. 1896 over there. So almost this entire downtown is on the National Register. It is considered uh, one of the top examples of early Texas architecture. And as you can probably guess, these buildings will be here forever. It is basically a museum down here. You can see um, the downtown is very healthy too. No empty buildings or storefronts here. They've got businesses in all of them. Goliad was named after a Mexican priest by the name of Father Hidalgo. Father Hidalgo is one of the most important people in Mexican history. Father Hidalgo triggered the Mexican Revolution against Spain. He is Mexico's version of George Washington. So you're wondering, 
how do you get Goliad out of Hidalgo? Well, it's an anagram, except for the H. They drop the H out of the equation because that letter is often not pronounced in Spanish anyway, and arranged all the other letters to form the name Goliad. So do you guys think that's it? No, not even close. Got a lot more to show you. So uh, let's go do that right now. I'm at the Presidio La Bahia. This is a fort built by the Spanish army in 1749. It was the site of the second battle of the Texas Revolution in 1835, when Texas declared independence from Mexico. It was the site of a massacre. Here is the story of that massacre. Now, during and after the battle for the Alamo, Texian Colonel James Fannin was here at this fort. After the Alamo was lost, General Houston sent a message to Fannin to pack up his men and meet them, that being the Texian army, in Victoria. A few miles out of Goliad, the Mexican army caught up to Fannin and his men, and a battle ensued. The Mexicans outnumbered and outgunned Fannin and his men, so Fannin negotiated a surrender. The agreement was, if the Mexican army will just let them go, they'll drop their arms and leave peacefully. The Mexican general agreed to this, and Fannin and his men were taken back to this fort. A message was sent to Santa Ana, who was still at the Alamo, about this agreement. Santa Ana replied, no, we take no prisoners. I want you to execute every last one of them. And so the Mexican army marched the men outside of the fort and shot every one of them. Colonel Fanning was the last one to be killed. They wanted to make sure that he saw that all of his men were dead and then they shot him in the head. This is one of the most important events in Texas revolutionary history, and as the war ground on, it became a rallying cry for the Texians. Remember Goliad. These are the nine flags that have flown over this fort. Here, let's read the sign here. So we got the United States flag, of course, Confederate flag, Republic of Texas, First Independence Flag, Second Republic of Texas, Mexican Flag, First Republic of Texas, French Flag, and the Spanish Flag. The Presidio was one of the most fought over sites in Texas. Every attempt to change the order of government in colonial Texas involved the capture of the fort. In 1812, it was the site of the longest siege in Texas military history. Nine years later, it was the target of an American force attempting to conquer Texas for the United States. The Presidio Chapel was the site of the signing of the first Texas Declaration of Independence in 1835. And during the Texas Revolution in 1836, it served briefly as the headquarters of the Texan forces under Fannin. And then as their temporary prison after their defeat at the Battle of Calito. All right, I'm inside the building now. It's a museum. So I'm just going to kind of walk through it so you can see the interior of this place. Wow, 1749. This building is old. There's a chapel on the grounds. We will get to it shortly. That's pretty significant. Yeah, let's see if I can go out into the... Yeah, there we go. Yeah, the open area of the fort. 
Now let me see what I can find here. I'm walking along the outer wall of the fort and you see these holes. That's where the soldiers would shoot their guns. At attackers, obviously. Yeah, you just got them every few feet. corner of the fort there. It's got a cannon. A couple other things that you probably would have seen. During that time. Isn't that great? Why would you look at this, guys? This cat lives on the grounds. That's pretty obvious. He's walking right into the Loretto Chapel, which is right here. Before we go in there, though, let me show you this here. Where the lookout would hang out. You see a spot there. So the guard could come in here and look in all directions. And there would be a little bit of protection because, you know, obviously he's in this turret here. Pretty awesome, huh? Now near the top of the chapel is a statue of the Lady of Loretto. It was created by a guy named Lincoln Borglum. Now Lincoln was the son of a guy who created an even more significant sculpture. His dad's name was Gutzen Borglum and he sculpted Mount Rushmore. Some stuff I want to show you inside here. Let's go check it out. Now, from what I understand, the first Declaration of Independence, and we're talking about Texas, was signed on the altar right here in this church in 1835. And I want to see this mural here. It is a Texas version of the Annunciation that is the angel Gabriel telling Mary that she will be the mother of Jesus. Now there's the chapel over there. I'm on the other side. And I'm pretty sure this is where they would house the soldiers. It's a fireplace here. Maybe this was a dining hall, I'm wondering. Or maybe just a general gathering room. And it looks like there was uh, beds here. Yeah, some more. So this is where the residents here would, or the soldiers would sleep looks like. Some of them anyway. It's hard to imagine that many of them didn't sleep out in the open. I doubt they had these restrooms though. <laughs> anyway, yeah. So yeah, there it is. One of the most important people in the history of Mexico uh, was General Ignacio Zaragoza. And he was born here. I guess we'll go inside and take a look. Let me tell you about him real quick though. He had a great military mind. It was evident from the very beginning. 
1854 as a captain in the Mexico Civil War, he, or one of his first victories, was against Santa Ana. Now Santa Ana had become president by this time and was basically a dictator and not everybody in Mexico liked that. So there was an uprising and like I said, he led a battle that took down Santa Ana. But his biggest victory was in Puebla, Mexico a few years later. This was in 1862. Uh, 600 of his men, him and his men, held off and defeated a French invasion force of 6,500 men sent there by Napoleon. Napoleon sent, sent them there to take Puebla because he wanted a permanent outpost in the Americas for France. But Ignacio defeated them, or Zaragoza, and that event happened on May 5th. Of 1862 and is celebrated to this day. You know it as Cinco de Mayo. Father of Mexican independence, Hidalgo, a Mexican Catholic priest, called for a revolt against Spanish rule in 1810. He led an army of farmers, villagers, intellectuals, clergy, and native Indians towards Mexico City. Forces loyal to Spain captured Hidalgo and executed him. His sacrifice inspired others to continue the fight, and Mexico won its independence in 1821. Cinco de Mayo is not Mexican Independence Day, although the two are often confused in the United States. Mexico marks its Independence Day on September 16th. On that day in 1810, Father Miguel Hidalgo urged Mexicans to reject Spanish rule. His words came to be known as the Cry of Dolores. And this public declaration led to his execution. Cinco de Mayo commemorates the May 5th, 1862 victory of General Ignacio Zaragoza's troops over a better equipped French army. The defeat stunned the European power and the world. I think there's a ghost in here I'm trying to open that door. There in the distance is the Presidio we were just at. This is Fanon's monument. It is here that his body and the bodies of his men that were massacred, this is where they are, underneath it. There's the names of the men that were uh, massacred, killed. want to understand, yeah, they're buried beneath us, all of them, uh, on this mound here. Texan soldiers of Colonel Fannin's command killed and mortally wounded in battle. This is Francida Alaves, also known as the Angel of Goliad. Now I told you about Colonel Fannin and the massacre of his men. Well, not all of them were killed. Francida entered the Presidio the night before the massacre and managed to get 20 of the men out of there, and uh, which saved their lives. In other conflicts, she also persuaded the Mexican army to spare another about 106 Texians uh, during this conflict. So for the Texans of the time, she was held in very high regard. She was a Mexican girl. Uh, by all accounts, she was 19 years old. And for some reason, she had pity for the Texans and went out of her way and took risks to save their lives. Now, later in life, she lived in Matamoros in poverty. And Richard King, who was the owner of the legendary King Ranch, saw her there, remembered her, and brought her to the ranch, and it is there that she lived the rest of her life. King Ranch, by the way, is the largest ranch in the United States, bigger than the state of Rhode Island. 
Just taking a quick look here on the other side of the Presidio. La Bahia gift shop. I don't know if that's open anymore. Okay, well. Yeah, let's head into town, take a look. The population of Goliad is about 1,900 people. That's peak population. So the city is doing really well. Median age is 38. That's about the same as the U.S. The U.S. is 39. 58% of this town is Hispanic. 35% white. 6% uh, black. 1% Asian. I've seen this in a couple places in town. They decided not to cut the trees down. Just built the road around them. Isn't that something? I got a tree right here in the middle of the road. I like that. The median household income is 39000 That's $752 a week. Well, check out this church. It's an Episcopal church. This is pretty cool. Yeah, that's kind of beautiful, isn't it? How narrow it is. Yeah, I really like that. Yeah, another tree in the middle of the road. Some beautiful homes here, though. And then the occasional abandoned home, or empty home, partially boarded up. Yeah, no one lives there. Here's one up here for sale. I am on Chilton Street. Uh, this is 252 Chilton. That is some house there. You look at that, and it is for sale. 242 Chilton. Yeah, let me get that address right. What do you think something like that goes for? I mean, wow, that is some kind of house, isn't it? Somebody look that up. Tell the rest of us. I'm sure we're all curious. So, uh, poverty, it's pretty low, a little bit higher than the U.S., 19% overall. Children 17 and under, it is 14%. That's about the same as the U.S. Folks 65 and older, though, it's not very good. 40%, that's really high. All right, well, cost of living, it's pretty low, 17% lower. Groceries are 14% lower. Healthcare is 19% lower. That's pretty good. Housing is 42% lower. Median home value here is 173,600. So you can live pretty cheap here. I don't know if that means it's a good retirement place, but there is a small grocery store and there's gas here. Uh, they do have some facilities uh, if you need them. So you're wondering about crime? It's low. Uh, latest numbers. 13 incidents per 1,000 people. That compares to the U.S. of 23 per 1,000. 
So nearly half uh, the crime, it's lower. Now look at all this beautiful old decay. I don't know why, it's, there's just a beauty to this kind of stuff for me. Oh, that, to me, just doesn't look livable. This was it's set in here, rotting into the ground. Just rusting away. Yes, someone lives there. There's a dog out front. I don't know, that's shocking to me. That someone lives there. And that I can't even tell what that is. A little tiny trailer? That's unreal. It's got a tarp for a roof. That is something. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. I've been to some really poor towns. And this town's not that poor, actually. I'm surprised that's allowed. Uh, the town I live in, the city, that simply wouldn't be allowed to be there. All right, everyone, so that's the end of this video. We're almost done with Texas. As I told you earlier in an earlier video, we had to hang around pretty close to Dallas because we had some end of the year stuff that we had to take care of, doctor's appointments, that kind of thing. So we've got a West Texas video coming up next, and then we're heading out west, uh, New Mexico, all the way to the coast of California. Then we're going to a Caribbean island off the coast of Mexico for a little short trip. After that, uh, we've got some Mississippi and Alabama, maybe some Georgia. And then after that, as it starts to warm up, we are heading to Northern California, uh, Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, Northern Montana, Northern North Dakota. That's all coming up into early summer. And then we will be going up into Ohio, uh, over to Maryland, Washington, D.C., uh, Delaware, down into Virginia. That will take care of a lot of summer. And there'll be other spots, too, as well. We're going to try to sneak Hawaii and Alaska in, somewhere in there. So that is what's on deck into summer. Hope to see you guys uh, with us. Hope you come with us. And, uh, well, we'll see you then.